hello, my name is Ross Oak. I work uh, for uh, the Truth and Reconciliation for the Adoption Community of Korea. And we, short form is just track. And our main issues, uh, the broader focus is children's rights, but we specifically focus on oh, inter-country adoption abuses and oh, adoptee rights uh, specifically out of uh, Korea. As you probably know, and as many people actually know, uh, with the Republic of Korea being South Korea, uh, they have they have had one of the largest adoption programs in the world. Uh, the official estimate is about around, if I can remember correctly, uh, around one hundred sixty some th <clears throat> excuse me one hundred sixty some thousand children that were that were adopted abroad. Um, but actually, the unofficial estimates go all the way up to two hundred thousand children. A lot of people uh, have the idea, not only outside of Korea, but also within Korea, that uh, adoption was sort of a humanitarian response to the Korean War and that they needed the adoption program because of the poverty that was uh, happening with, with Korea. But actually, if you look at Korea's economic development and you look at the number of adopt adoption going, and you look at those two rates, you'll find that actually the highest number of it, as the econ economy developed, also the adoptions increased. So if we, when we think about, oh, did Korea really need adoption? Well, there was a time and, you know, there was made have been a time and a place for that, yes. But as for throughout this long of a time period, then no. Um, so because of basically adoption, the adoption program uh, took over and served as the main social, I would say social welfare response for vulnerable families um, and those families that were suffering from separation, what you'll see is that it basically replaced the social welfare system. If you take any economic or economics course, you'll see is that um, in order to increase the economy, you basically, you need to, you know, population, if you have a large population, it's going to be difficult. So, so the Korean government tried to reduce its population, right? Um, so on the one hand, we have, we, you know, you can reduce the population by, well, well, sending them abroad. But on the other hand, also, there was, through, through the economic development, there was a lot of people, um, especially young women, going to work in the factories, and they were coming from the countryside. So as they went into the factories in the cities, in the urban areas, um, they were losing a lot of their support networks, right? So, and of course, there was issues with pregnancy, outside of marriage, um, and overall, Korean society discriminates. It, it still continues to discriminate, ha discriminate heavily against that. So... What you what basically happened was okay. It's the government had a choice. Had a choice. It could uh, it could try to take care of these children that were from uh, the you know these vulnerable children, which would also require them to spend more money on social welfare, um, or they could just send them away. And in a way, they could actually sort of uh, I don't want to. It's not the most how can I say um, nicest way to put it, but basically they could make money off of it in a way. You know, if you send them abroad, you can get money coming into the country. On the one hand, when you're you're also reducing the uh, the amount of money you actually have to spend for these vulnerable families. On the one hand, we focus on the rights of adoptees and accessing their records, uh, improving, uh, not only also improving, like for example, uh, the processes for doing birth searches, uh, things like that. Um, on one hand, then on the other hand, we also focus on Oh, uh, uh, like more of the policy area on making specific recommendations for uh, alternative child care reform, reform for domestic adoption, intercountry adoption, oh, uh, in those areas. The basic idea that a child has a right to know who the who its parents are, or a child has a right to an identity, um, it has a right to this certain information. And in Korea, that's still like an open adoption. A lot of people consider is that if you're told that you're adopted, it doesn't have anything to do more with about you know who adopt, you know who you who you came from, et cetera, things like that. Um, so that's one of the issues. I mean, when it comes to uh, single mother, single parent discrimination, that's still very large. And when I say single parent, I should qualify that by saying that specifically unmarried mothers is the largest group that's still discriminated against. Um, <clears throat> it has been improving. We've been working with. Um, some of the unwed mothers activist groups and it has definitely the situation has definitely been improving but it's taken a lot of work to get it to actually improve um, so for <clears throat> excuse me so for just to give you an um, example uh, a real example of like one of the uh, 
unmarried mothers had talked about how her child was on a playground and some other mother found out that it was the child of a single mother and she said, I don't want my kids playing with that trash. No, it has been declining. That's because the government has implemented, I mean, since the 1980s in the Olympics and there was a bunch of media attention and everyone was saying, especially North Korea was saying that um, the South Korean government's a baby exporter. That's a more famous thing thing is they, they export babies um after that the korean government took a different uh sort of take, took a different approach and where it wanted to increase domestic adoptions to decrease the intercountry adoptions and uh so basically it put in a quota system so it would try to reduce like about 10 percent each year um so the rate has been declining very slowly but i would say i, I would also want to add that when it comes to when you're looking at numbers actually it's not so much the numbers um because it's like when you artificially push that number down by reducing it by 10%, you're not actually, and the Korean government actually hasn't really dealt with what is the cause of the issue. So by pushing it down, it doesn't really fix the problem. It just moves it to another area. That's all. I think that Koreans, I mean, Koreans overall, they tend to feel ashamed about the issue of adoption and that they're doing it and that the country is doing this. Um, but I think it's still this mentality that, well, we were a poor country at that time, so therefore it was justified what we did. So they definitely feel sympathy. They definitely feel a certain amount of, I would say, um, shame and pain towards what happened and what happened to adoptees. But it's still, in a way, it's justified, they feel. Uh, yeah, I was adopted. Um, but uh, I would, so a lot of people might say, oh, you're an angry adoptee, so you want to do this, um, you know try to reform the system, things like that. And actually, um, it has nothing to do with that in a way. I mean, it is it definitely started out on a personal level and it still has a personal connection, of course. Um, on the one hand, on, but on the other hand, uh, I would say too, is that actually, uh, for me, um, I had actually, I mean, I had a good good experience when I was younger with adopt. You know, my, I still get along with all my family really well. They, they support what I do here. Um, and everything like that. And I would say overall, too, it's not really, I think, because a lot of people like to put it as either if you had a bad experience and adoption is bad or you're angry. If you had a good experience and adoption is good, blah, blah, blah. They, they put it that way. They frame it that way. But really, it should, I feel, it should be framed more as, you know, it's a child rights, human rights issue. You know, it does, I mean, yes, you could have a good experience or you could have a bad experience. Really, nobody knows that. But if um, leading up to that end situation, if the process, during that period, there were human rights violated, then that's an issue. You know, that's a problem. I would say I sort of stumbled on it in a way, a little bit. Um, for well, when I first when I first came to Korea, it, I only came just for about. I had planned a visit for like three months just to see Korea. I just want I wondered what Korea was like. It wasn't really to find my parents or anything like that. I just wanted to see what Korea was like. So when I was about 21, I came here for just three months and I thought I was going to stay for a vacation. But then actually I met this other activist group in Seoul and they were doing some um, adoption activism things. And uh, I had met with them and they talked to me about some of the issues going on with, you know, intercountry adoption. And I was like, well, you know, I would like to do something also in this, you know, and I so I attended their meetings and worked with them for a little while. And then after that, I also worked with uh, a single mother's uh, group home. Uh, so, you know, I got to see sort of like uh, right on the ground of what's going on with the situation. And, you know, when you meet these, when you meet all these different people, um, it it does have an effect, you know. An intercountry adoption, like last year, if you look at last year's numbers, right? I mean, it was like we're talking like 300, 200, 300 people that were affected by intercountry adoption. That is a really small number. And if you look internationally, the rates have dropped to maybe around, I, I can't. I'm not very good with statistics. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but we're talking like maybe 20,000 or less people. So, I mean, it's a very, very small group of people that you're dealing with. On top of that, you have very strong lobby groups in the United States, in Europe, um, that, uh, and, you know, nobody wants to come out and say we're against intercountry adoption because it really being against is not, an, it's not the main thing. I mean, being for or against is the main issue, but the, the pro adoption groups will, anyone that has any critical thing to say about, um, intercountry adoption, they'll automatically label them as anti-adoption, you know. So you, you still have this huge political machine that's sort of pushing against you on the one hand, 
and you're also sort of dealing with an issue that's so very, very small. So a lot of people don't really want to deal with it. Like, for example, even a lot of people, um, I would say in the UN and stuff, they don't really want to deal with it because it doesn't affect a huge amount of people. And at the same time, if they do try to deal with it, even touching it sometimes is a huge political black backlash they face from the pro-adoption lobby group. So I would say, um, do we face an uphill battle? Oh, definitely. Um, but at the same time, I think if you if you get pessimistic or lose that sort of hope about it, then it doesn't really help this situation, I guess. And for at least for my my situation, it doesn't really help it, I think. 